in AI. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big hand. Thank you. Um, as a, thank you very much for having me. And it's exciting to see the amazing progress made here in Seoul in AI just in the last couple of days. Um, it's an exciting time of expansion for AI, and I look forward to chatting with you about it. One of the difficult things to understand about AI is, is a general purpose technology, meaning that it's not useful for just one or two things, it's useful for a lot of different applications. And in these 15 minutes, I hope to leave you with three messages. Uh, first, for businesses, that AI is a general purpose technology, and this gives us tons of opportunities to build exciting applications. And for governments, I hope to leave the message that it's important to distinguish between technology and applications um, and to promote innovation and safety to regulate applications, not technology. And lastly, the Prime Minister spoke about the important topic of sustainability and hope to share with you some exciting tech trends that allow us to keep building AI models maybe in ways that seem more sustainable without as much electricity use, for example, as also how um, AI, I hope, can be a key piece of solving or addressing climate uh, climate change. So first for businesses, <clears throat> opportunities from a general purpose technology. Um, AI has been around for a long time, but generative AI started to take the world by storm a couple of years ago, and many of you will be familiar with generative AI that can generate text and images. Yesterday at the dinner organized by the forum, we were treated to some wonderful Korean music. So inspired by that, I went back to my hotel room and used AI to compose Korean um, to compose music for the AI Global Forum, inspired by Korean style. Um. And it goes... <laughs> and AI progress is so rapid, it lets us all do things that just were hard to imagine one or two years ago. Um, the impact of general purpose technology, of generative AI, is, is impacting many different industries. My team at uh, Deep Learning Diet AI Fund took some data from McKinsey and reanalyzed it, so you probably won't have seen this chart before, trying to understand what's the automation potential from generative AI on many different industries. And we see sectors like education and workforce training, business and legal professions, STEM professions, community services, and so on. Many industry sectors will be hugely impacted by AI. And this is a chart from a, a research paper by some friends at UPenn and some folks at OpenAI, estimating the exposure of different types of jobs to AI automation or augmentation potential. And the interesting thing about this chart is the horizontal axis is salary, going uh, up to about 163,000 US dollars a year. And the Y axis is the automation potential from generative AI. And you see that it's the higher wage jobs this time around, the knowledge work that is more exposed to AI automation. This is unlike earlier ways of AI where it tend to be the routine, repetitive work, maybe factory automation that was more exposed to um, automation. And <clears throat> I'm seeing a couple of things today. First, right now, at this very moment, I think every knowledge worker can gain a productivity boost by using generative AI as a brainstorming partner, um, <clears throat> to do the basic research, uh, and so on. But most workers will need just a little bit of training to know how to use it safely and responsibly, but that productivity boost is possible today, not, not a month or two from now, but today. So I think this raises a challenge for uh, governments to provide, and companies to provide upskilling for people to learn to use these things. And <clears throat> in addition, Many of you will be familiar with using websites like ChatGPT or Gemini or Claude. Um, but in addition to the web user interfaces, generative AI is also creating a lot of new opportunities to write new types of software applications that just were not possible and were much harder to build before. And that too, new software, not just the ChatGPT-like applications, will be an important step for how AI brings value to a lot of people. And when I speak with both governments and businesses, a question I'm often asked is people say, hey, Andrew, you say there are a lot of opportunities. Where are the biggest opportunities? So I want to share with you what I think of as the AI stack. Um, at the lowest level is the semiconductors, um, very important. Often we have cloud companies building on top of that. 
um, and then AI tooling companies that sell AI technologies. And it turns out that whenever there's a new wave of technology, like there is with generative AI, the media tends to talk a lot about these layers, about the technology layers, about the tooling layers. It's, it's fun to talk about what OpenAI or Google or NVIDIA or, or Samsung or SK Hynix are up to. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out that while there will be opportunities in these layers and there will be some huge winners, I think that there's another set of opportunities that's even bigger, and that's the application layer. Because almost by definition, for the technology companies at the lower layers to be successful, the application companies had better do even better and generate even more revenue so they can afford to pay the technology providers. And I think for many nations um, and for governments building services for citizens, a lot of the focus should be on building applications. So I think there'll be opportunities up and down the stack. Um, and so, oh, and, and this is why uh, my, my team AI Fund, we actually end up building about one startup per month, and there are just so many things worth building. Um, in addition to all the opportunities to build, for governments, I think we want to promote uh, both safety and innovation. And there's one key message I hope to leave you with, which is the importance of distinguishing between applications and technology, and to regulate applications rather than technology. So here's what I mean. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna draw a technology layer, as well as an application layer. So let's use an example. An electric motor is a technology. You can design an electric motor. And that electric motor, which is general purpose, can go into many applications, including a blender or electric vehicle or a dialysis machine for healthcare um, or a smart bomb. And if you look at each of these applications, we can ask, how do I make a blender safe? How do I make an electrical vehicle safe? In contrast, it's very difficult to say how they make an electric motor safe. If, I try, if you try to say, I need to make electric motor safe, you end up just building very, very small electric motors, and which, which is not what any of us want. So technology refers to tools that can be applied to many ways to solve many problems, and applications to specific implementations that solve particular customer needs. Um, in the case of AI, AI models are a technology. For example, you may have heard of large language models. This is where AI researchers use AI to read lots of text on the internet and learn to predict the next word over and over. That's a technology. And this technology can be used to build a medical device or to give medical advice um, or for, to, to build a social media feed or to build a chatbot um, or uh, to use political deepfakes. Some of these are good applications. Some of these are maybe more problematic applications. But when we look at the applications, we can then figure out what are the risks, what do and do we not want in social media or in medical devices and regulate against the actual risks. And the, the, the challenge I'm seeing for many governments is um, risks are a function. They depend on the application, not on the technology. And when you regulate the general purpose, if, if someone regulates or puts burdensome licensing requirements on the general purpose technology, like electric motors or like AI models, that tends to just slow down the technology unnecessarily to my mind. But once you look at specific applications, then you can figure out what you do and do not want in medical devices and these other applications and regulate against the specific concrete risks. And this will enhance safety um, while also not slowing down, not cutting off the source of intelligence and slowing down innovation, which is what some proposals slowly dying, but some proposals to regulate technology, I think, would do. Um, <clears throat> And just to be transparent, I feel like over the last year and a half, I've been surprised at the intensity, deep intensity of some lobbying efforts um, against open source software. I think to promote innovation, and as well as ensure equitable access to AI, one of the most important things for all of us to do is to promote open source software. Open source refers to when developers write AI software and post it on the internet, free for anyone to use. And this is a key mechanism for research and for technology to develop and be disseminated. Unfortunately, there are some companies that would rather not compete with open source because if you've invested a lot of money and someone open sources it, it diminishes the value of investment. And there's been intense lobbying to pass safety regulations that will stifle open source. Um, and if these efforts succeed, I think almost everyone will be a loser because it'll make it much more difficult for almost all businesses, almost all countries to access AI technology. So I think um, I've been delighted to see the number of smart government officials pushing back on this uh, type of over-regulation. So <clears throat> talked about um, uh, general purpose technology, technology as well as distinguishing between applications and technology. The last thing I want to leave you with is some thoughts on sustainability. 
So AI progress has been driven by scale. Um, when I was leaving the Google Brain team, uh, I told my team, number one mission is let's just build really, really big neural networks. Right? And fortunately, that recipe worked. Um, and over the last 10, 15 years, many teams are building bigger and bigger neural networks. And this has driven a lot of AI progress. Here, the x-axis is year, y-axis, the amount of compute. One thing that worries a lot of people is, given the rising energy costs of training very large AI models, is continued progress sustainable? I think it is. For at least you know, a few more years, we should, we can still build bigger models than we have today, but how long can it go on for? Um, <clears throat> I want to share with you one very exciting technology trend that I think everyone that cares about AI should pay attention to, that gives us an alternative path to build smarter and smarter machines, but without needing to just build bigger and bigger models with more and more electricity and bigger and bigger data centers. Um, and that's AI agentic workflows. Um, so here's the idea. <clears throat> I'm going to get a little bit technical, but this is an important technology. So it turns out that the way most of us use text generation, large language models now, is you go to um, ChatGPT or Claude or Gemini or, or Llama, Llama, and um, you type a prompt and say, please write an essay for me on a certain topic. And that's a bit like if you go to someone or AI and say, please write an essay typing from start to finish without ever using backspace. So you just write the essay by typing the first word all the way through to the last word. <clears throat> and I can't write very well like this, um, but despite this constraint, um, AI actually does you know, remarkably well. But it turns out that one of the most exciting technologies in the AI community is AI agents, which means that we'll ask the AI, please write an essay outline for this topic. And then ask, do you need to do some research? If so, go to the web, browse some web pages, and then write the first draft. Um, and then look at your draft and see what needs to be improved, and then revise the draft. And so this type of workflow looks more like this, with the AI think, and then revise the draft. <clears throat> and then after revising, go and think some more. And by iteratively working on the essay, you actually end up with a much better work output. And this is how you know, most of us write essays as well, and we're starting to get AI to do this. And <clears throat> one, one interesting study that my team gathered data for, um, this is a benchmark called, uh, for, for coding. It's called human eval, but it's seeing how well AI can write code. So with GPT 3.5, if you use what's called zero shot, that means please type out the computer program without ever using backspace. So on this benchmark, it gets 48% right. And GPT-4 is much better, 60% right. So GPT-3.5 to GPT-4 was a huge improvement in capabilities. But it turns out that if you take different AI agent or agent to AI workflow design patterns and apply them on top of GPT-3.5, it actually outperforms even GPT-4. So the improvement from GPT-3.5 to GPT-4 is dwarf. It's actually much smaller than the improvement we get if we get an AI to think over a problem over and over, and same for GPT-4. And I think this will be one of the most important technology trends because this, with even, and, and like many of you, I'm looking forward to maybe GPT-5 or I don't know, Claude 4 or Gemini 2.0 or whatever comes next. Um, but I think that rather than just waiting for those things, if you use today's AI models, so today's electricity constraints and add these type of technologies on top, you can already get really good performance, maybe even better than what some future models could do without, without this type of agentic workflows. Um, and I think this also may offer a more sustainable way to build more intelligent systems than only building bigger and bigger models, although I think we should do that too. Um, and then I think uh, the, the Prime Minister spoke about climate change. I want to just leave, leave you with one thought. I think often we wonder if AI is the problem, but sometimes AI may not turn out to be the problem. Maybe it'll turn out to be a solution. I don't know if it'll be the case for climate change. Um, but it turns out that I think one of the most uh, promising options we should consider for climate change is climate geoengineering. Specifically, this technology, <clears throat> there's an idea called stratospheric aerosol injection in which you spray aerosols high up in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight away from Earth. <clears throat> and this is like throwing up an umbrella over our planet that gives ourselves more shade to cool down the planet. The science that this will cool down average global temperature is actually very solid, but we don't understand the local effects. So um, some of my collaborators and I um, should build, use AI <clears throat> to build a climate emulator to try to understand, uh, simulate, how the climate will evolve with or without geoengineering. So we know what it is up to 2024. Um, with geoengineering, without geoengineering, we end up 3.9 degrees, and with, we end up with about, what was that, 2.5 degrees. And I think AI climate simulations like these, I think would be critical in order to better understand solutions like geoengineering, which I think is a 
important potential, not sure this, but important potential short-term amelioration of, of, of uh, climate change that we should, that nations should seriously consider. So rather than um, viewing AI as the problem, which sometimes it is, to be honest, I think AI can also be a key part of the solution to this most pressing problem of our time. Um, and, and just to wrap up, <clears throat> these were my three messages. I think for businesses, AI is general purpose technology. A lot of exciting work lies ahead to build applications. Um, for governments, I hope you distinguish between technology and applications and to promote both innovation and safety, we should, I hope you regulate applications and not technology. And lastly, for sustainability, there's new technology, agentic AI, that I think all of us should pay attention to, as well as I hope um, AI can also play a role in uh, addressing climate change. With that, let me thank you all very much.